Greetings to you and welcome to session 16 on the Gospel of John. I am Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio, and it's a joy to be with you today as we spend this time together. I pray that you are doing well, and I pray that whatever whatever you face, you know, whether you're listening to this live first thing in the morning, or whether you're catching it midday or in the evening, or maybe even tomorrow or the next day, or whenever you're catching this, whenever you are listening, I pray that it is... A benefit to you and I pray that this is a powerful message for you as as best I can and I also pray on the outset that this changes you it gives you some inspiration some guidance some love some hope uh, as we move forward in this world so it's a joy to be with you today if this is your first time tuning in to these sessions I certainly welcome you uh, I would encourage you to go back and check out some of the previous sessions, uh, some of the other good stuff that we've been doing. We've been walking through the Gospel of John from the beginning. So the previous sessions are going to have a lot of work about, uh, you know, the previous stuff out there. So check it out. Check out the previous sessions. Go look them up. Uh, listen to them. And if you've been following along, if you want to go back and listen again, that's kind of the joy of studying the Bible is that. It changes. We change. So maybe you're going to hear something different. So I certainly would encourage you to go check out what we've got going on. So uh, so welcome. Uh, this is uh, sec, uh, session 16. I would encourage you to have a Bible open in front of you, uh, whether it is a, um, a digital Bible or a paper. Uh, it doesn't matter what translation or paraphrase you use. I use the New Revised Standard Version, but you can use whatever it is that you feel comfortable with that you feel is going to have an impact for you. So use that, uh, have it open before you so that you can read and and see what's going on and get caught up. And, and again, you know, part of some of the things I say over and over is that biblical literacy is so important. Following the Bible, being able to follow along is so important. And knowing what the Bible says, you know, we live in a world that, that quotes the Bible a lot, and most of the time it's accurate. I mean, most of the time the, the quotations from the Bible are accurate, but sometimes not. And so as solid believers, we want to make sure that we are following along and we know what the Bible is saying. To the best of our capabilities, we want to know what the Bible is saying. So I certainly always recommend having a Bible open before you. I also recommend reading the Bible every day. Open that book every day. You're not going to wear it out. And if you do, there's plenty of other copies. We can get you another one. Open that book every day. Read through it. Read what's happening. Read where people are in the face of, of the world. So definitely check it out. Definitely check out um, reading the Bible every day. Try it. A couple of days. A couple of words. Whatever. Uh, but I hope you have a Bible open before you. Uh, New Revised Standard Version, like I said, is what I use. But hey, whatever you have. Uh, whether it's King James or the message or what have you, I, I always recommend having the Bible open so you can follow along and and hear what we're doing with and, and, and hear what we're talking about and read along with it. Because who knows, you might want to use it again later, go back to it later. So we're in the Gospel of John. Now, you get the point. Yeah, I, I'll move on. Uh, we're in the Gospel of John uh, and... Um, and we're in chapter six. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of chuckling as I'm as I'm talking because if if I were with the group uh, when when we're doing in person Bible study, they'd have that. All right, Pastor, you beat this to 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 a pulp. So let's move on. Look on their face. So um, I'm chuckling because I can see those looks on people's faces. So uh, so we're in chapter six now. John is the fourth book of the New Testament. So the Bible is divided up in the Old Testament, and New Testament, uh, and John is the fourth gospel: Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So we have the three synoptics: Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, which all tell a similar narrative. And then we have John, which also tells a similar narrative, but focuses on a lot of different things, as well as focuses on kind of a different identity, a different style. Uh, John is not necessarily as much telling a story as he is telling how to live a Christian life and what it means to be connected to the Savior, which is why I think this, um, you know, this this book is so powerful and so, so, so really good for us to be able to dig into. So we're in chapter six. So uh, chapter six. Um, uh, again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, sixth chapter. Uh, and I think I've said this before, you know, when these books were originally written, they weren't divided up in a chapter and verse. That all came a great deal later. Uh, so so we're really blessed to have these markers. But um, anyway, so John chapter six. Now, the, the first part of chapter six was all about the feeding of the 5,000. We studied that last week. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to um, the last week's text, I'll probably refer to it a little bit. 
But that's what we talked about last week. That's where we were last week was John chapter 6. So definitely uh, check it out. Um, Feeding of the 5,000 is where we were. So it's uh, it's a good piece. It was a long piece on Feeding of the 5,000. So we're going to pick up after that here. Uh, and and we, where we left off last week is after the feeding of the 5,000, the people realized that Jesus was, uh, that there was power in Jesus, that Jesus did something, was something. So Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. This is uh, verse 15. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So Jesus realizes that there are people who want to make him king. Uh, they want a king. The people have been yearning for a king for thousands of years. They've been yearning for a good king. You know, let's keep in mind, the people have always had a king, but they've been yearning for a good king. They've been yearning for a king who's benevolent and loving and going to do what needs to be done. They've been yearning for a king who's going to show grace and hope and vision. They haven't had that. They haven't had that in their king. They haven't had that in their leader. What they've had is someone who's been, you know, a puppet to the Romans and before that a puppet to the Greeks and before that a puppet to the Assyrians and before that, you know, so it it turns out that um, that they've been yearning for a king that represents God. You know, I think the people at their core are faithful people. They want to be faithful. They want the temple to be faithful. They want the the priest to be faithful. They want the king to be faithful. But they're not getting that in what they have um, in their current king. They're not getting that. So they're, they're yearning for something more. And they see the power of God in Jesus. And so they want to make him king. There's a desire. There's probably a, a call out. To make him king, making him. Jesus realizes this. And and like I said last week, but I, I want to make sure that I'm clear. With Jesus being king over Israel, that doesn't do Jesus or the mission any good. Okay? Jesus doesn't benefit by being the king of Israel. He does not benefit by sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. He doesn't benefit by having Herod's temple. He benefits by freely being able to move from place to place, person to person. That's one of the powerful things about him coming as this, this, this poor, impoverished, itinerant preacher. Is that he has the freedom. He can walk wherever he wants. Wherever he wants. Wherever he goes. He can walk wherever he goes. He, he, can, he can engage whoever he wants. And yeah, some people are going to get mad from time to time. Yeah, they're going to feel bad. Blah, but um, that's not where... Uh, Jesus wants to be. Jesus doesn't want to be recognized. He wants to be free to be able to move. He wants to be free to be able to move and go about his business because that's where the work of God is. The work of God sent by Jesus is not for him to be in a temple in Jerusalem. It's not. He is not sent to be in a temple in Jerusalem. He is not sent to sit um, in the halls of power. He is sent to be able to freely go into the lives of those who need it. He is sent to freely be able to go into the lives of those who, who are broken, hurting, and desperate. And he can't do that when he is on the throne in Jerusalem. He just can't. So when the people want to make him king, when they want to... Uh, when they want to coronate him as king, he wants to get away. He needs to get away. He withdraws by himself to um, to the mountain. He withdraws by himself to the mountain to be alone, to be protected. Because now one of the things, a couple of things I want to make sure that we keep in mind here. I haven't really introduced this before. I'm going to kind of introduce it now because it seems relevant. There is nothing here. That is outside of God's control. Everything that is taking place in the midst of the life of Jesus, there's nothing here that is outside of God's control. Okay? So, Jesus isn't going to be taken and made king until he's ready. Jesus chooses that. Not the people, not the rulers, not anybody else. Jesus chooses when things happen. Jesus chooses when he dies. That is all in God's hands. There's nothing that's outside of God's control. There's nothing that's outside of God's purview or grace. It just doesn't happen. So so Jesus knows what he's doing. This isn't some kind of, of oh, I don't want to be king or what have you. No, this is purely 100% Jesus choosing what happens. Jesus choosing what happens. Jesus chooses what happens in the face of, of, of the work. Jesus chooses 
what happens in the face of the work. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He did not want to be taken up and be made king. That's just the way it rolls with Jesus. Anonymity is his friend. Anonymity is his friend. Anonymity is what allows him to go about doing what he needs to do for the sake of the world. Anonymity is his friend. Okay, and you know, and I say this, I say this pretty often um, with with the group. You know, I'm, I'm anonymity is my friend too. You know, people know me. People know who I am. Of course, uh, it's not that I'm, a, a, but but I'm not a celebrity. I, I can go to Giant Eagle up the street and buy a green pepper, and I'm not going to be you know besieged with um, either demands for autographs or like massive amounts of questions as to why I'm ethically buying green peppers or unethically for that matter. You know, we certainly have a celebrity culture that we live in. We have this culture of celebrityism. We want celebrities. We th- strive for celebrities. We thrive to to be celebrities in the world. Um, and so we have this celebrity culture. And, and the closer we get to celebrities, the the better we are. But Jesus doesn't want that. Jesus doesn't want this celebrity status. He doesn't want to be known. He wants to be. Uh, he wants to be alone. He wants to be anonymous. So his anonymity allows him to go out and do what needs to be done without attracting a whole great deal of attention. He wants to be able to go out and do what needs to be done without people weighing him down or trying to make him king. He doesn't want that. That's not what Jesus wants. That's not who Jesus is. So uh, he withdraws. You know, he likes his anonymity. And like I said, I, I like my anonymity too. I, I'm, I'm pretty happy for that uh, in, in most cases. My, my anonymity, my ability to move about from place to place uh, with, with general amount of, of ease. Again, it's not that I'm trying to hide anything. That's certainly not the case. But um, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's because it makes it easier. I, I, I'm not feeling as constrained. So that's where Jesus is at. So I want to make sure that we're clear about this. And I also want to make sure that I'm clear why Jesus wants his anonymity, because he can move from place to place. This is a God on the move who has come down to the poor. This is a God who has fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. This is a God who loves the people and loves the people close in, not from a distance. The king, the rulers, they love their people from a distance. They love their people um, as long as their people provide them with wealth and resources. Jesus is not like that. That is not how Jesus rolls. Jesus loves his people close in, and that's what he wants people to see. That's what he wants people to know. And he's a God on the move. If he's made king, he wouldn't be able to move. He'd be caught up in the, uh, he'd be caught up in the, um, in in the temple all the time. And that's not where, that's not where God's action happens. God's action happens in the midst of the people. All right. So just so we're clear about that and, and I'll probably, um, you know, kind of unpack that a little bit more as we go on. There'll be other things where I'll talk more specifically about the, the primacy of Jesus and the power of his sovereignty and all that kind of stuff. So, so we're going to move on from there. So now we're in, in chapter six, verse 16. And uh, that's where we're going to pick up. Sorry, I just bumped my microphone. So I hope there isn't uh, hope there isn't a, a, a big bump there. All right. So when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough uh, because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. All right. So, so, um, so we just finished up with dinner and Jesus had retreated by himself. Remember that's just what we were talking about. So Jesus retreated by himself. He is now, um, uh, it is now late. So the disciples, they've gone down, they've gotten in the boat. Now, Who knows? We don't know if Jesus had instructed them to get into the boat. We don't know if this was a, hey, if I'm not back in 10 minutes, then leave without me scenario. We don't know if it was pre-planned. We don't know if the disciples just got tired. We don't know if the disciples, you know, realized that they were going to be fighting a heavy storm. We don't know. Okay. What we know, what the scripture tells us, and this is really important, you know, biblical interpretation Sometimes we have to fill in the blanks. Sometimes we have to weave into the story to figure out what's going on and how to interpret it. But sometimes we can spend so much time trying to figure out the minutia of detail that we miss the point. 
And that's not what we want to do here. We don't want to miss the point by, by dwelling in the minutia. We don't want to look at the little. We don't want to find the little and say, oh, you know, we're going to dwell in the minutia while at the same time missing the whole point about what's going on here. What's going on here is that the disciples are in the boat and Jesus isn't with them. For whatever reason, the disciples are in the boat and Jesus isn't with them. Um, that, and that's the long and the short of it. That's what we have. That's what the scriptures tell us. It does not tell us that Jesus was upset with the disciples or the disciples were impatient. It doesn't tell us any of that. All it tells us is that Jesus was not in the boat with the disciples. Long and short of it. So, fair enough. Lo and behold, uh, Jesus is not in the boat. He is not with the disciples. They are out there. And it says they rode about three or four um, about three or four miles. Now, now here's the thing about mileage. You know, miles was not a um, miles was not a, a, a distance measure in the New Testament. Okay, this is where we as the people, this is where we as uh, modern day people, where the interpretation of the scriptures, the translation of the scriptures helps and it changes a little bit. And what does it change is it changes this distance. So really, truly, they had rode about 25 or 30 stadia. Okay, about 25 or 30 stadia. That's what the original text said. Uh, But we don't know what a stadia is. We have no idea what a stadia is. So the modern interpreters of the Bible, the modern translators of the Bible, they do the calculations for us. They do the calculations for us to see exactly what we're talking about here. So it's not just uh, so it's not like, oh, you know, I didn't realize they measured in in miles in uh, in the New Testament. They don't. But this is for our help. This is for our uh, benefit that we have because we have a, con- a concept of what three or four miles is. And, and they're out pretty good. I mean, they're certainly out there a long way in the boat and it's not easy rowing. Uh, they went down, got in the boat, started across the sea to Capernaum. It was dark. Jesus had not come to them yet. Okay, so that's where we are. Um, the sea had become rough because a strong wind was blowing. So, uh, again, it was getting windy. It wasn't necessarily an easy row. Uh, they were working hard at this. They were working hard to get out as far as they were getting out. This is, uh, again, so, so we see the disciples in the boat, far off land, and the sea was rough. All of those things are important for us to grasp and understand as the things are moving forward. You know, this story is told in other Gospels. It's told about there was a sea or there was a storm. Uh, sometimes Jesus is, is, uh, is in the boat sleeping. We see similar stories like this throughout uh, the New Testament uh, gospel uh, narrative of the New Testament. But what we have here in John is that the, the, the strong wind was blowing. The sea had become rough, high waves. Again, and you, don't, you don't need 30 or 40 footers when you're rowing a boat, probably a, a, you know, an 18-foot fishing boat or a 15-foot fishing boat. Uh, you don't need strong seas. You know, you're, you're, getting, um, you're getting a good workout just rowing. So three, four foot waves is still enough to cause a great deal of, 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 of work for the disciples. So the disciples, they're, they're rowing, they're, they're pulling, you know, uh, and they're going along and sure enough, as they're going along, they look up and they see Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat. They see Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat. So, that is what they're experiencing. That is their vision. Uh, the seas are rough and they see Jesus coming near the boat. Now, it says in the text that they were terrified. Okay, so let's be clear about something here. Um, we're reading into this and we're thinking, how could they be terrified? It's Jesus. Don't they recognize him? Notice some of the contextual clues we get in the story. It's rough. The wind is blowing and it's dark. It was now dark. So, If there's a strong wind blowing, then most likely there is going to be clouds, okay? Uh, Clouds mean that the moon is going to be covered up, which means that there's not going to be a whole lot of light. If they had any light in the boat, it would have been very meager. 
very small. Again, we need to we need to do away with the notion of spotlights and flashlights. That's not the case. They didn't have anything like that. So there may have been a little bit of navigable light, even with the with the moon shining in the background. There may have been a little bit of navigable light, but but they didn't have anywhere near what um, what would have been needed to understand what they were looking at. Okay, so you have um, Jesus walking on the water. It's dark. The waves are rough. They can't tell that it's actually him. They can't tell that this is Jesus in the flesh. They just see a form, an amorphous, walking on the water. What are they supposed to do with that? How are they supposed to deal with that? They can't necessarily deal with that. They can't necessarily figure out what that is. And you also need to understand that throughout human history, there's always been stories of, 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 of ghosts on the water. Uh, this is a fishing culture, okay? And as a fishing culture, they would have had many stories of friends or colleagues. Maybe they knew people that died in that died out on the water, that died in a boating accident, that died in a uh, you know in some kind of fishing accident. So what happened? I mean, this is a very superstitious culture. So now, do you have ghosts walking on the water? Is this some kind of spectral energy that's coming towards them? All of this terrifies. I mean, they're, they're concerned about the boat. It's dark. They don't know where their master is. They don't know where they're going. And all of a sudden, they see something walking on the water. How terrifying would this be? It would be absolutely terrifying. You know, we can't judge the disciples or hold the disciples in contempt. It would be absolutely terrifying for um, for for them to 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 see this. They they would they'd be shocked. And we probably would be too. I mean, let's be clear. Out, out on the lake in the middle of the night in a rowboat, yeah, we would be too. We would be pretty darn scared. Let, let's be honest. We'd be pretty darn scared. So, so here we are. They're, um, you know, they're, they're in the boat. They're scared. But then Jesus said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. It is I, do not be afraid. Uh, and, and so Jesus doesn't want them to be terrified. Jesus doesn't want them to be frightened. Um, he doesn't want them to 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 get all kind of crazy because he never and 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 this is the thing as much as Jesus could use his godly power, use his godly presence to enact fear. Jesus could have played with them guys. He could have ooed a little bit. He could have had fun with them. But as much as Jesus has this godly power, he chooses never, never to use it to elicit fear. Now, he talks openly about the apocalypse, yes, of course, but he never uses his power, his godly um, identity, to elicit fear with the disciples. He never does that to them. He never elicits fear in their life, or anybody else for that matter. Um, He never wields his power with fear. Unlike other gods, I mean, even like the God of the Old Testament used, you know, used fear as a as part of, of the of the arsenal of human interaction. Um, but we don't see that out of Jesus. We see a maturation of the creator in Jesus who doesn't use fear as a weapon, but uses love. So he doesn't even allow the disciples to be afraid. He he quiets their fears very quickly. Um, and and so we get. Again, and this is where translation can have a challenge because we wouldn't speak this way uh, from from an English perspective, which is why it's a footnote. He says, it is I, do not be afraid. But actually, in the original language, it's probably closer to I am, do not be afraid. Okay, so so let's go back here a little bit, and, and we're going to see those words, I am, come out a little bit more. Uh, but but we, we need to go back to Exodus when Moses is standing at the burning bush and, and you know, God tells him to go down and, and speak to the Egyptians. And Moses says, who should I say is sending me? And God says, I am, I am, I, the great I am sent you. Uh, and if we look at the 10 commandments, everyone, I am the Lord, your God, I am comma, the Lord your God. 
you shall have no other God before me. I am, comma, the Lord your God says you shall not make graven images. I am, comma, the Lord your God says you shall not murder. Okay, so so this would have fallen much more in line with the spirituality and the understanding of God. I am, do not be afraid. So it's far less about um, recognition and far more about identity because they would have just been like, whoa, okay, I am. It's God. God is showing up. God is walking on the midst of chaos. And from a spiritual perspective, as we look at this from a spiritual perspective, we understand the water as representative of chaos. So water represents chaos, which it does. I mean, in, in, even in our modern culture, water represents chaos. Water is a chaos distributor uh, within the culture because we can't see in it. We can't control it. In the ancient world, of course, they couldn't dive in it. They didn't know what was below it. They didn't have any kind of sonar or anything like that. So what you wind up having is you wind up having this chaos. Chaos, chaos, chaos. This is where Leviathan is. This is where the, the great beasts of the ocean are, yada, yada, yada. So, so there's great fear. But here's Jesus walking on the chaos. Here's Jesus walking over the chaos. Great spiritual imagery here. Notice, notice that Jesus doesn't calm the chaos when he walks on the sea. Notice that Jesus doesn't come in and first thing he does is, is calm the chaos. That's not the play. The play is to walk into the chaos. Once the chaos is calmed, we don't need God. But life is chaos. I mean, life is always chaos. There's really, we may have moments of calm. We have, may, may have peaks of, of balance, but life is chaos. We know that. It's always chaos. So, so Jesus is walking into chaos. He's walking on chaos, um, walking on the rough water. They wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. So, so we have a little bit of mysticism here. We have a little bit of, 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 of um, divine intervention here. You know, the, the, we never see that the, that the waves calm, okay? In other stories, we have Jesus calming the waters, calming the waves. We don't get that here. That's not what we experience here. What we experience here is that the journey through chaos is complete, while the chaos still lasts, while the seas are still rough, the journey through the chaos is complete. And that's the, I think, one of the most important things that we get out of this is that Jesus walks on the chaos. He's part of the chaos and the chaos remains. So there's, there's chaos all around, but the journey through the chaos is complete. And Jesus completes the journey through the chaos. How incredible is that? How wonderful is it that we have this journey through chaos? And, and you know, we do. We, we journey with Christ through chaos, but that journey is completed. Not because the chaos is removed, but because Jesus journeys with us through the chaos. That's what we see. So before they could take him into the boat, they get to the other side. They reach the other side. Um, and they reach it safely and soundly and no one is lost. And Jesus is Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the dude. He's the one that, that saves and brings about redemption, uh, from the lost and redemption from chaos. Okay. So there's a lot of imagery here. There's a lot that is unpacked in this about who Jesus is and about how Jesus interacts and what Jesus does for us. So, so awesome, you know, um, awesome imagery and awesome power and what God has to offer. All right. So then the next day, the crowd that had stayed, this is verse 22. Sorry about that. So the next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not gotten into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. Okay, so the people are paying attention. They see that the boats have gone. They see that um, Jesus and the disciples are no longer on this side of the Sea of, of Galilee. 
And so they go after him. And why not? Uh, you know, again, we don't want to overthink this. We don't want to over spiritualize this. We don't want to over. We don't want to think that that they had somehow had this incredible, grandiose spiritual epiphany, this enlightenment beyond enlightenments. No, there, there may be some who'll be like, wow, I mean, this dude is is really something. But they got a good meal. I mean, think about it. They ate their fill, and this is in a time when people didn't eat their fill. You ate what was available, but you didn't necessarily get to eat your fill. They got to eat their fill, and they did it off of Jesus' hand. Jesus was the one who provided this meal. So why wouldn't they? Lord in heaven, why wouldn't they go out and look for and try to find Jesus? Of course they would. They would go out and try to find Jesus. They certainly would want to go see if they could find him and 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 get more food. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, this guy's giving out free lunch. So who wouldn't give out and who wouldn't go looking for another free lunch? Any of us would. Let's be clear. Any of us would. Uh, so so it's important for us to, to grasp that. It's important for us to understand that, you know, these people, they're, they're looking for Jesus because they ate. Now, some of them, of course, may have a deeper experience. Some of them may truly acknowledge that this guy is a prophet and something really, really special. Cool. Well and good. That's awesome. But most of them are just looking to eat again. And that's what Jesus encounters. Most of them are looking to just eat again. So they're looking for him. They're, they're off searching him out. They're off looking for him. Jesus has gone to the other side of the sea. Jesus has gone to the other side of, Caper- of the Sea of Capernaum or the Sea of Galilee. Uh, he's over there doing, doing you know, his stuff. He's over there doing new things. So uh, and they're looking for him. So when they found him, this is verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the bread. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe? What work are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as, as, as it was written. We gave them, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. All right. So, uh, like I said, they came looking to eat. They came looking to have a meal again. And who wouldn't who wouldn't go looking to have a meal? Who wouldn't want to to eat um, a free meal? Who wouldn't want a free meal? Of course, we'd want a free meal. You, you would have to be sort of a little inept, a little a little loco not to want a free meal, especially in a time when when food is really, really scarce. It's really, really hard to come by. So, so they, you know, they, they, they kind of pull an end around. They don't ask, you know, what's next. They, they ask, you know, Rabbi, when did you come here? How did you get here? This is really kind of great. Um, um, here you are. Here we are. Not really sure what to say. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say something really kind of off the wall or out of it. Yeah, we see uh, we see the other disciples doing that in different circumstances. Uh, we see the other disciples doing that, like on the Mount of Transfiguration, when they're just not sure what to say. They don't know what to say, so they say whatever comes to mind. Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus calls them out on it, and again, and 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 Jesus isn't critical. Jesus isn't judging here. He's just being honest. You're not looking for me because you want to learn from me. They call him rabbi, which means teacher in Hebrew. But he's like, you're not here because you want to learn from me. You're not here because you, you're here because you're hungry. You're here because you were hungry when you met me and then I fed you and now you want to be fed again. You're here because you're hungry. Let's be clear about that, my dear, dear friends. Let's be clear about that. You're here because you are hungry. And I'm willing to talk about feeding you, but it's far more than just bread for your belly. Do not work for the food that perishes, but work for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Okay, so 
This is not to say, Jesus is not saying go hungry, okay? Jesus is not saying go hungry. Jesus is saying don't invest your world, your life, your identity in the food that's going to go away. Don't keep trying to get things that are going to go bad. That's just not a good play. That's not a good play at all. Actually, invest in the things that will continue well after your belly gets empty again. Invest in the better food, the food that lasts for eternal life, the food of creation, the food of the son of man. So, so that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, Jesus is moving this. All right. He's fed their bellies. He has shown that he has some power in God's name. So now he is moving things in a different direction. He is now spiritualizing this relationship. He is now moving it further than just going into um, some kind of, of, of food blog, if you will. Jesus is spiritualizing this circumstance to go something deeper. Uh, and 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 to move the people away from just baseline fill in their bellies, physical feeding a need. You know, when we just feed a need in life, that need always continues. We never find balance. We never find peace. We never find um, uh, we never find anything that, that's that, that, that stabilizes and moves us forward. We just keep going back. I'm hungry, so I eat. And when I'm done eating, I'm full, but then I'm going to become, become hungry again, so I'm going to eat. So there's this continual cycle of need, of, of, of physical want. But Jesus is saying, look, don't, don't work for that. Now, this is not to say don't, you know, don't ever do anything. It's just don't put that much energy into it. Eat what's there. Um, just eat. You know, food is is uh, is a fuel for your body. It's not. It's, it's nothing more than that. Don't spiritualize it. Don't emotionalize it. Just eat what's there. Strive for the bigger. Strive for the food that comes from the Father. Strive for the food that comes from the Son of Man. Um, for it is on Him that God has set His heel. This would be the Son of Man. This would be Jesus. Um, Son of man, son of God, they interchange, they interact. Jesus uses the different words depending on the circumstances that he's in. Okay, so Jesus presses on. He's like, look, don't strive for this food. For, strive for something greater. Strive for uh, the work of God. Strive for the work of God in the world. And this is the work that, that, that they just saw him do. Feed each other, love each other, lift each other up. Get involved in each other's life. You know, one of the things that we need to keep in mind, one of the things that we need to keep focused is when you live in subsistence lifestyle, where all you're doing is providing for yourself and there's no room or no energy, you spend very little time being caring about anybody else. You spend very little time caring about where your where your neighbors are. Again, and this is not out of anger or hatred or anything. This is out of just pure self-survival. This is the way it has to happen. So the people... Again, it's not that they don't care. Of course they care. They're, they're ultimately concerned with what's going on with themselves. And they would be concerned with their neighbors if they had time, if they had energy. But they don't. They don't have that time or energy. What they have is enough time and energy to provide for themselves. But what Jesus is saying here is Jesus is saying, look, you need to turn things on their head. You need to stop spending so much time desiring to provide for yourself in this world. This life is transient. This life won't last forever. And there's something bigger to it than just what you stuff in your, in, in your mouth, what you fill your belly with. That is what you need to be striving for. The work that the son of man has been given to do, to love each other and lift each other up. Is it going to be costly? Absolutely. Is it going to require time? Yep. Energy. Oh yeah. Investment. Absolutely. We like to think that following Jesus, just like, Hey, it's all good, but it doesn't require anything from me. Bunk. Garbage. No, 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 no. It requires something from you. It will always require something from you. Following God always requires something. It always requires some kind of investment. That's just how it works. Okay, so here are, uh, you know, here's, here's Jesus saying, look, I mean, follow with what I'm doing, get on board with this and you're never going to go hungry. This is the food. This is the bread. So they say, you know, what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Believe in the son, believe that God has come into the world. And an extension of that is believe that whatever the son is doing is what God wants to be done. 
See, that's the thing. It's not like, oh, okay, I, I believe, I believe Jesus. I believe that you're the son of God. I, okay. I believe you're the son of God. Come into the world. Now what? Now do what I'm doing. But you're like loving people and touching the poor and, and, and hanging out with the downtrodden. Is that what we're supposed to do? Uh, yes, that is what you're supposed to do. That is the work. You know, that is the work of the son of God is to do what you're supposed to do. That is the work. So get to work. Get to work doing what you're supposed to do. Get to work being part of the Son of God. Okay? So do what the Son does. Do what the one whom God has sent does. Okay. Well, so what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe in you? What work are you going to perform? Um, really? You just saw what I did? You know. So so if we're going to buy in Jesus, we need to see that that you're worthy and they use the example of moses they use the example of moses providing food in the wilderness what do they say they say you know our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written he gave them bread from heaven to eat so they follow moses they believe in moses they're part of moses because moses was the one who told them that god was going to feed them Okay. It wasn't Moses who fed them. It wasn't Moses who did the, did the manna from heaven stuff. That was all God. God was the one who did all of that. They ate because, because Moses said, this is what's going to happen, but it wasn't Moses who gave the food. That's where they get confused. They want to put, they want to put it on Moses. Like it's some kind of, of magic trick, but that's not the case. It wasn't Moses who provided uh, the bread from heaven. It was God who provides the bread from heaven. It's God who provides the true bread from heaven. And that's what Jesus says. We need to not look at Moses like Moses is some kind of, of, of magic power wielder. He's not. Your ancestors ate in the wilderness, not because Moses gave them the bread from heaven, but because God did. God was the provider of the bread from heaven. God was the one who gave the bread from heaven, not Moses. Moses just said, this is what's going to happen. Moses was the mouthpiece. Moses was the prophet. But Moses wasn't the one baking the manna every night and sprinkling on the ground. Moses wasn't the one who was clapping his hands together and making it rain bread from heaven. That was all God. That was all God. And that's what Jesus wants to put forward. Don't confuse the gift of God by the one who's in charge. Because what they want to do, what they want to argue is they want to argue that, um, you know, Moses is the dude. Moses is the big guy. We should follow Moses, yada, yada, yada. And Jesus, what sign are you going to do? What are you going to do to show us that you have this power? Well, Jesus is like, look, I mean, I already did something, of course. and But they're like, we want consistency, power, sign over and over. That's what they're asking. Why are they asking Jesus what sign he's going to? Yeah, they fed him. He fed them. He fed them once. Is he going to feed them again? Is he going to feed them over and over? Remember, they got the man as they got the man in the wilderness for over 40 years. So is Jesus going to feed them over and over? Is Jesus going to fill their belly so they can go after their spirit? Is that going to happen? If it is great, if not, then what's the point of following him? That's the question. That's the question that they have. What's the point of following you? What sign are you going to give us to show that we should follow you? All right. And Jesus says, look, you know, um, the bread that came down from heaven uh, is, you know, it's God that gives a true bread from heaven. Uh, the bread that leads not to hunger, but the bread that leads to satiation. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. So they're, they're talking two different thought streams here. So you have the people and they're thinking bread, like loaf, like Asiago cheese or, or focaccia. Okay. They're thinking something they're going to stick in their mouth. Jesus is talking about the bread from heaven. Jesus is talking about the life of, of the sun, the connection to God's work in the world. That's what gives life. Life isn't about what we put in our bellies. Life isn't about what we put on our backs. Life isn't about what we turn the key in. Life is about having the interaction and the connection that we need to have for the sake of the world. That is what life is. And we get that life through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We get that life through connecting to the Son. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't saying, hey, you know, um, Jesus is saying, look, if you want life, then this is where life comes from. Life doesn't come from bread and water. Life comes from interaction with the divine. That's where life comes from. So if you're looking for life, then find it in me. Find it in me. Find life in me 
not in food or anything else. Seek it out in me and I will give it to you. That's what the son of man does. Seek it out in me and I will give it to you. Um, and they say, sir, give us this bread always. But what they don't realize, what they will come to realize, but they don't realize right now is to get that bread always is more than most people can handle. All right, so I'm going to leave it there for today. I'm going to leave it there for now. I know it kind of threw a lot at you, and it's all good. You know, we traveled through it. If you have any questions or whatever, you know, my contact information comes up at the end of the um, at the end of the end of the session. Uh, you can reach out to me directly and send me a comment. Uh, I'll do the best I can to answer them. I'll do the best I can to share. You know, whatever whatever I can to make sure that you're um, aware and that you got going on. Uh, so thanks for thanks for tuning in. Thanks for spending your time here. Hey, if you like this, if this is powerful, if this means something to you, then share it. Share it out there. You know, share it off the off of YouTube. Share the link. Uh, share the Facebook post. Share the Instagram post. Share it. Let's get the word out there. One of the things that is our requirement as Christians is to take the word that God has given us and give it to others. That's one of the requirements we have as Christians. So if you like this, if this is powerful for you, then share it. Share it with your friends. Put it out on your Facebook page. Put it out on your Instagram page. If you know someone that might benefit from it, then give it to them. Share it with them. Send it to them directly. Tag me in it uh, and 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 let me know where you're at. I'd love to know. I'd love to hear. So thanks for tuning in. Like I said, my contact information will come up at the end of this session if you have any questions. Hey, be well. Be blessed. Whatever you got going on today, may it be wonderful. And we'll talk to you next week.